So, thank you so much for uh, adding some uh, hope elements to our conversation because I think it's really, really important. Uh, before we deepen a lot of the points that have been made by uh, Donatella and also in the yesterday's discussion in, in the small breakup groups, we still have uh, incredible people here in the panel uh, and we will use this moment to, to continue the conversation and to still look uh, and try to analyze and to respond, to give elements of response to some overarching questions that we are all also wondering how can we better create an impact and how can we overcome fragmentation and there are a lot, a lot of questions uh, that we are asking ourselves also in a difficult context where uh, we are bound somehow to look uh, at failures, to look look at the fact that somehow uh, our ideas and our goals uh, at the societies we hope to see are not having a, a great political representation. If we look at our uh, political class, a little bit everywhere in Europe. So uh, with, the, with the panelists today, we are going to try to look at these questions and also in a spirit of not necessarily only looking at the challenges, but trying to give and to find some elements of hope, including from our own experience, because I think that spaces like this uh, are very important to really try to motivate ourselves in order to go on the fight. So uh, I will briefly introduce our panelists today. Uh, Anika Jane Doherty, she is a feminist. She is a fellow of Young African Leaders Program at the European University Institute here in Florence, and she is uh, East African coordinator of the organization and the community campaign organization Amplify Girls. Uh, probably she has a lot of other roles and she will be able to tell us about uh, in a minute or so. We have Laura Sullivan, executive director of We Move Europe, uh, a campaigning organization, but also uh, which has been very active uh, Europe-wise in civil society building and movement building. Uh, we have Calypso Nicolaidis, who is chair of Global Affairs, School of Transnational Governments here at the European Institute University in Florence. Uh, she is the convener of the EUI Democracy Forum and she has a lot of other hats that uh, are important also for the conversation today. Uh, Christophe Aguiton, who is um, a long, long-standing activist and also sociologist, uh, unionist and political activist and founding member of uh, Attack France. Uh, and we have, do we have with us online Jain Mejai? So we also have Jan Mejai Tivari, sorry if I'm not pronouncing correctly your name, Secretary General of Global Young Greens, who is connecting, kindly connecting with us from, yes, from the COP27. So, Jan Mejai, really, uh, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, I will not spend so much time because we had several, several introductions. I'm a little bit concerned with the time. I really want also to have, first of all, a couple of round in the panel, but also have enough time to, to get back to a conversation with, with the people present in the room. So, with no further ado, I will start with Annika. And uh, we will go firstly, maybe, with a, with a very, very general uh, question that will allow you, all of you, to share your experience, but also if you want to react to, uh, to Donatella's introduction and to try to look into what, how can we, what builds agency and what are the factors that really help us um, create long-term progressive and systemic change? And how can we be more connected and more impactful in our daily struggles? And hopefully talking from your experience and building up some positive and encouraging examples of what you've been seeing so far in your activist life. So let's start maybe with Annika, if you want, and then we will, uh, we will continue let's say, in the order that you appear in the program. Okay. Um, I, okay, I think you can hear me now. Uh, hello, everyone. And, um, well, I happen to uh, do some work in building agency. Um, and right now, we are looking at what is the measure of success for a girl um, and a woman. And um, we have come to the conclusion through a research study that uh, building agency is critical to a girl's success and therefore, you know, eventually a woman, you know, a young woman and a woman in her space. Because agency um, is the reason why we, are, as you know, women exist in an unspoken state of silence, you know, 
where you cannot ask for equal pay, uh, you cannot speak up uh, in a space of, you know, GBV. We are moving towards 16 days of activism soon, and, you know, and many other spaces. And so agency is also one of the reasons why my continent continuously s stays in a space where we cannot um, clearly or bluntly, you know, call out some of the vices that, you know, go on and some of the relationships that are not um, quite fair or, you know, unjust in some ways. Um, and so I feel like um, if we can be able to invest, um, I know, okay, the UK is no longer part of Europe, but they have a, a really ambitious program towards supporting uh, education specifically, you know, in African spaces. And at, in that space, um, changing curriculums in a lot of African countries is, you know, something that is going on, you know, um, uh, currently. And so I think it's important that just as we talk about um, gender equality, and a lot of my interventions are on that, you know, space of, of women and gender and, you know, uh, correlations, you know, between Africa and Europe in that space, then, um, uh, introducing or having these conversations at ages that are younger than ours would be ideal, you know, in school systems and DTC. And then, you know, it would mean that we don't grow up in the same household with half of our, you know, children in being brought up in patriarchy. And that is not just, you know, in, in my space, but across the world and, you know, the other half in empowerment. And then we grow up and we don't understand each other in our workspaces, in our, um, in our you know, activist spaces, because our public spaces and our private spaces are not, you know, um, together. So that is my, th those are my thoughts on agency. Um, and I'll take it on to the next one. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, thank you very much. Um, let's go on with Laura. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Um, so my name is Laura Sullivan. Uh, from the accent you'll get, I'm from Ireland, but I've spent the last 21, and I've spent the last 21 years in Brussels observing um, social movements, NGOs, and the policy and political process. And, but what I want to talk about just now is the specific experience of We Move Europe in terms of trying to generate transnational activism to shift power in Europe. I also have an unhealthy uh, sort of obsession with postcards, so I was delighted yesterday when we got these postcards uh, uh, at the exhibition, and I will hold on to them. They are very dear to me. Um, other people use post-its or PowerPoints. I've put some ideas onto the postcards. So, the first thing that we go by relates to what was said here yesterday, which is we need to recognize the importance of the institutional level, but also the cultural level, and what some refer to as the, the seeds of the new society and economy. And so we can keep banging on directly to the European Parliament all we want, but it won't work unless the movements are also doing the work at the cultural level. And it all uh, sort of works in a mutually advantageous or not kind of a way. Uh, and those seeds of the new economy and the new society are the things that are generating ideas that, that really help that. We also work on the idea of rooted connectedness. So, you know, you can, again, rock up to the European Parliament in Brussels and try to change things, but it won't work unless you're, you're really connecting the local to the national to the European. So it's not just about what's happening in Brussels. Europe is absolutely everywhere. Um, and you've got to be near those levers of change, but you've also got to be near the roots and the reality of people. And it was very nice to have dinner last night at a place that felt very rooted. I think the third thing is, you know, something that never changes, that if you want to create agency, you have to organize, organize, organize. And We Move Europe is very young, it's seven years old, and, uh, you know, we're only starting to get past communicating and mobilizing into actual ongoing um, sort of organizing of people digitally and offline. But that is very exciting. And we're very much influenced by the wisdom of Paolo Freire, but also Anat Schenker Osorio, whose words are engage your base, persuade the middle, and alienate or ignore the rest. <laughs> and that is really inspiring. Um, the community that is We Move Europe is basically 1.1 million people across 30 countries in Europe, not the EU, but the wider Europe. And uh, what that really is, about a quarter are quite active, take regular actions, whether online or offline, to push change in Europe. 
And the reason, when I call people up in that community to say, why the hell do you support us? Why do you take these actions? Why do you give us money? What, what is this? They say consistently the same two things. One is belonging to a community that makes me feel I am part of something. I am not alone. And the other is the chance to change things. Um, and that relates to this card, which is stories of hope but not false hope. And that it's this Buddhist balance, isn't it? Because when you're talking about wins, you need to not bullshit people. You need to tell people the truth. And at the same time, you need to be able to generate enough hope and optimism to get people off the couch to take action in the first place. And it's always a balance between those two things. I also feel we need to celebrate a hell of a lot more because, uh, particularly as civil society, we love to self-flagellate, but we don't really, uh, are not very good at celebrating. Getting to the end of the postcards, you know, the vision that is transformative and radical has got to be based on the root causes of what's going on. And often we are trying to change a sort of a word in a legislative text at the EU level, but that's not where it's at. It's got to be at what is really at the root cause of what is going wrong and an, a profound understanding of that that is based on history and, and the present and the roots and what is going on at local levels across Europe. Last things are get prepared for the crises and the patterns that establish themselves in politics. We know that things keep happening again and again and some stuff is really uh, predictable. I think we are particularly rubbish at being ready for the next crisis and I'm very excited to next week to be going to a gathering of digital campaigning organizations in Berlin which is about getting ready for this winter and getting ready for the politics that will start to unfold in these next uh, months towards the European elections in 2024. The last thing I couldn't uh, resist was feminist leadership, which is not feminine leadership, but feminist leadership that's all about power and shifting power and understanding where that power is and uh, humility, inclusion, eccentric levels of optimism and, and really uh, tra you know, transformative ideas based on the brilliant stuff that's been done in the past and, and that, that which is yet to come. Basta. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> uh, I think it was very, very comprehensive. And uh, does it work? Um, in the afternoon, we will also, I, I think uh, the, you brought almost everything has been said uh, in such a quick time. But uh, I, I would really like us to insist on the celebration moment and the building of activism of joy, because we, we really tend to be so much in the dissatisfaction mode and so much in the, you know, um, also looking up to the politics, but also looking down to our own strengths and sometimes weaknesses. So let's let's keep this positive uh, forward looking of, uh, of joy and um, even joy building. Uh, let's go on then with um, uh, with Calypso and uh, Christoph. Hmm. Is it work? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th th thank you so much. I have to confess here, make a confession. Like I'm in a family, um, and indeed. Bill is up there. That power hierarchies are reflected in academia. So I speak here as an, a, an, a great fan of the work uh, of the work of the center here, and indeed um, of the European Civic Forum, with whom we've collaborated very much at EUI. And in a way, as an old trust guide, I, I'm not sure I'm an old trust guide, but I feel like I am infiltrating you up there to a great extent, although Donatella, you were there for many years, and I'm so lucky to, well, as do that, to have co-conspirators, some of whom are here, Jamie, Andrea, you know, who help in making these bridges. And, and I, I think when you ask about the levers, and we're talking about ideas and symbols and actions on the ground, of course, when you're an academic, I divide academics who work on democracy and social movement between those who are in the ivory tower and those who are also activists, like some of us, you know, all our lives. So that's one, one of the things. Um, and and, I, and, as an, and as an academic activist, the first thing I believe in is to use the classroom as a space of transformation. Um, of the minds, uh, but you let the students transform themselves. I do it with my critical theories bias. I do it 
um, with the kind of diagnosis that underpins everything that Anika and Laura have talked about. I'm a feminist IR. I believe in that the international arena to this day is hugely gender hierarchical and that these hierarchies are reproduced in scholarships and in institutions um, all the way. So the first thing is to kind of push back uh, Alexand Alexander now about this. But I think push back in, in, in a way that tries to integrate. It's hard when you're an oldie. You know, with the new, new gener Gen Z things, everything we want to learn from Gen Z and from one's kids. I, I've been advocating that the EU should become a Gen Z EU, that, that the Gen Z should have power everywhere uh, in Brussels, and that Brussels should look like Gen Z um, in ways we could discuss. Uh, my, my students' kids love it, my colleagues don't love it as much, and the bureaucrats with whom we work, and Alexandrina and I are often on those Zooms, no, don't look like it all, always as much. So for me, there's kind of three levers that we're discussing, and that Donatella's great paper, which already assigned to my students, you will know, um, you know, I mean, they raise at least three big issues. One is a power. What do we think about power? Yesterday, I felt at Casa del Popolo that we exemplified the three relationships, you know, the medals, you had those who work, like so many social movements, you know, against power, against the state, our friends in Poland and Hungary and Eastern Europe especially, um, and those who work with power. And a lot of your paper, Donatella, is about the new ways in which we work with power. Um, is it co-optation co or is it actually conflictual cooperation? You use this term very much in the paper, collaboration. Um, and what compromission happened with that? But the, but the, third, the third point was the um, working alongside, separately from power. And that's what the Casa, it's an old idea, Casa del Popolo. We heard, yet, we heard it yesterday. But I think increasingly what's fascinating is that the new generations, they do it. They create spaces of alternative power providing, you could call this services in the technocratic, but providing the needs, providing space where we do things for each other. It is all the collectives, but they've renewed it by creating, and you, I say they, you, because many of you are in the room, have, have done that. But I think we have very hard question to ask about our relationship, I say our, as social movement, as activists, uh, with power, um, because, you know, how, how when we, de we are still demanding money to the Commission, and I'm not criticizing that, uh, but you know, here, here with the European Civic Forum, we, we are in a position of subordinates. Um, how do we deal with that? How, how do we get them to change their culture? That we create the space where we interact. We, they don't bestow a state upon us because they've taken our taxes and then they decide how to give it back to us. Um, we have to ask what powers about how we change the rules of the game. Uh, Donatella speaks a lot in her paper about Iceland. I think you, this is, and you, in your book, I mean, this is something you, an example you. And indeed, that's where social movements say, we, we, we need to go to the top and change the very rules of power. But there is a fascinating thing about how they excluded political parties. And I, I have very mixed feelings about this. And I'm not sure you don't say explicitly, Donatella, so I want to push you on this. You know, we have five stars here, we have Podemos, we have, in Italy and, and, and Spain there's been so much thinking about the interaction between social movement and parties that want to conquer power and our relationship to power. Um, you know, should we be a Gramian, Gramscian block with them? And how about trade unions with themselves has complex relationship? You talked a lot about the labor union, um, Donatella, but I think social movements are still making ad hoc alliances with the union. And yesterday with Albina, who will speak later, and with Alexandrina, we were talking about that, that beyond ad hoc movement, there, there is a fear. How do we, there is a fear from these more traditional spaces of power conquest about us. And there's always been a rivalry. Of course there is a rivalry. But I think in the era where we're negotiating post-liberalism, post-neoliberalism, we need to ask about structural alliances between forces of progress much more systematically. Reassure the trade union. I'm saying reassure because they often push back against social movements. You're taking our space. It's like as if the space was zero sum. So how, how, do, we, how do we deal with this? These are very, you know, much more to say, to say about this. Um, and how do we, at the end of the day, and this is so very much the work, amazing work Laura does, you know, better leverage the internet against 
powers that be. Um, you know, we, we are in the town of Machiavelli, where he said, at the end of the day, always distrust power at the end of the day. You know, have randomly selected citizen, uh, distrust your leaders, and can we create democratic panopticons, include, including We Move, that really give us a, that leverage of distrust and recreation. Now, I'm up with my time, so in the discussion, I'd like to talk about the other two points, two, two big kind of constellation. One is the relationship to time, Donatella, and you say it so beautifully, postpone gratification. I mean, I, I would like to propose that the Gen Z, new generations, they do that in spade and they have so much to teach us, or at least me, the oldies, in postponing gratification. Uh, the way in which in their very own body, they will take a bus to, for in that, you know, that thousand miles. They will not, my daughter doesn't eat meat for years when she adores me, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We all know all this in their bodies, in their lives. And so there is much more of a congruence for me between the personal life and the collective life of the next generation. And we want to ask how does this translate? And finally, the relationship to space, because after all, this 20 years anniversary is about transnationalism. And we have so much more means today, 20 years later, to do it, to, you know, to do the, what I think Next G feels even more than we did at the time, that what matters is the very local and the very global. And everything in between, Europe, the nation, and the corporations are means to, to reconcile these two things. Um, and even to, and really as Western North privilege, to reverse the gaze and learn from the rest of the world. To me, that was one of the greatest spirit of the world social movement and then European social movement of the global. And, and how do we do it today? We have the power of our interconnectedness. We experienced with COVID what this could do. And that was, to me, one of the most beautiful things is social movements watching each other being social movements during COVID. And the innovation, the connectedness with creativity, theatrics, festivals, the democracy of, of joy and hope that you were talking about, Alexandrina. So again, a lot to remember, but a lot to transcend and move beyond. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much. And I was very happy to hear Donatella and all of you because it was not a pessimistic approach. And uh, because a lot of my friends in the left or in the social movements are in a very pessimistic mood, thinking that it's midnight in the century, that we are coming back to the 930, remembering that one century ago, uh, Mussolini started his march to Rome. <laughs> and this idea was really at the center of a lot of uh, speeches and thought uh, in the left. And I think that it's wrong. That doesn't mean that there is no problem. Of course, there are a lot of problems. But when we look at what happened in the last 20, 30 years in our society, at least in Europe and the rest of the world, we could discuss, but it's a much longer discussion. Uh, a lot of things change a lot. Look, for example, at the racism. Uh, at the opposite of what people believe, the racism is declining in our societies. When you look at the opinion poll, there is a, a decline of racism in France at the exception of uh, gypsies, who are still very high in the uh, day-to-day -day racism, but all the other racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Arabic, anti-black people, all those things are declining. Look at the LGBTQ, the gay marriage. It was inconceivable 20 years ago. Today, in France, even if we had a huge movement against the gay marriage 10 years ago, now everyone accepts that, and it's seen as a normal issue. There is no problem on those issues. The right of women and the equality between men and women, there is also a lot of progress on that. That doesn't mean that the patriarchy is not there, of course but uh, there is a lot of progress. Look at climate change in Europe. Who believe that uh, there is no climate change, that it's not a human responsibility? Almost no one, almost no one in Europe. In Europe, huh? we can discuss later about the other continent. And if you, even neoliberalism is something which is not accepted by our society, which could create problem, huh? we'll <laughs> go back in the difficulties, but uh, it's also a big achievement of the people like uh, Rafael, uh, me and others who are fighting against neoliberalism, globalization from the last 20 years. And all those achievements were possible because we had movements 
It's not so only an evolution of the society. The LGBTQ in my country fight against the people who refuse the gay marriage. The Me Too changed totally the relation between men and women in a lot of countries in mind that others. Uh, we had in 2019, before COVID, a year of mobilization all over the world. Uh, if you look at the countries, we had everywhere mobilization, which explain also the victory of the left in Colombia or in Chile, for example. We had in France in the last weeks big movements the petrol station were uh, totally empty because there was a strike in the raffineries, there is a strike in nuclear plant, meaning we'll have problems during this winter <laughs> for eating the houses. There are a lot of things happening. That's the good thing. Now, the, the problems come, in my opinion, from uh, two elements who are very related. If you look at the global picture between left and right in Europe, democratic Europe, the countries who are democratic from the Second World War, we have always the same correlation of forces. If you have a, a sort of global vision, it's 45% of people vote for the left, 55 from the right. That, if you add uh, Italy, France, Germany, in, uh, Scandinavia, and so on, is 45, 55 during the, the first 50 years after the Second World War, with a very stable system of B party, more or less everywhere, and that worked all these 50 years. Now we still have this 45, 55, and there is no growth of the right, huh? at the opposite of what some people believe, there is none. What we have is a double movement. In the right, a big decline of the traditional right uh, institutional parties, Christian Democrat, uh, Gaullist in my country, uh, um, conservative in the UK, and so on and so on, and a huge rise, of course, of right populism, extreme right, fascist, uh, neo fascist, whatever we named that. That is a real problem inside this world of the right. And in the left, what we have, which is, in my opinion, the main problem, is the, the lack of global vision for the future. When I was young, we could discuss the vision of the communist, the social democrat, the anarchist, Trotsky, that we, we had this vision. That doesn't exist anymore. And that, of course, it's a real problem. It's not to say that it's uh, something secondary and that will be resolved soon. To give you a little example, we explain a little bit the difficulty in Chile or in uh, Brazil in the last election. I was in Belém in, in Brazil, end of July, beginning of August, for a big Panamazonic forum for people from all the region. In this region now, all the government are from the left. All of them, uh, at the exception of Ecuador, but Ecuador has also a big social movement and victory recently. But all the, 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 the different countries are led by left parties. When I arrived, we had a demonstration uh, for celebrating the, this uh, new social forum of Amazonia, and we have... <coughs> 5,000, 6,000 people in the street in Belém. It's not bad, a good demonstration. A lot of slogans against Bolsonaro, Fora Bolsonaro, everyone agree, and so on. But Lula didn't exist. No one was supporting Lula. No one was criticizing Lula, because, of course, to be for of Bolsonaro, you had to put Lula <laughs> in, the, in the box. But no one was talking about uh, there was no one poster about Lula, because Lula did a campaign, was only anti-fascist campaign against Bolsonaro. When we had the big assembly of the people from the Amazon region, we had people from every country of the, the Cuenca, the, the region. And uh, everywhere the left is in power. No one speaker talked about that. No one criticized the power, no one supported the power. It's like if it didn't exist, if we had another world. And that, okay, we can understand why there are indigenous people uh, fighting in the Amazon forest. Or, uh, a lot of reasons explain why they have immediate problems, poor against poor. The people we look after gold uh, are confronting the, the indigenous people. But nothing in terms of relationship between the government and the, the, the struggle, which is a real problem. I will stop with that now, but we can uh, go uh, maybe in the second term of the discussion about why and what to do, which is not so easy. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. This is why that's it in the end. Um, um, let's go to John Mejai. Can we connect back? John Mejai, are you with us? Yes. Okay, and we hear you, which is great. Hi. Uh, I'm Jen Medje uh, from India. Uh, uh, ah. I was not able to hear the keynote speaker because I was in the topic. So, so uh, just maybe I can uh, talk about a bit uh, which was given in the briefing. Just yeah. a second. Um, don't, don't you have headsets to use with the mic? Ah, I you do have. Okay. Okay, so then can Is you be maybe enough? closer to the mic? Because we have we have a sort of echo. Um, 
healing. Is it better now? Yeah, maybe if you can try to speak slower because then it will uh, compensate the, the echo and louder. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how louder I would, I would be able to speak because I am here in Egypt uh, at COP27 and we have been like uh, security briefings, like we are uh, in, uh, not in the very good space to like, speak to. Um, I, I'm sorry, but it doesn't work. I mean, we hear that you're talking, but we are not able to understand what you're saying, which is absolutely a pity. I don't know how to how to solve this because I have the feeling that is both probably your location which is um, which is in a kind of lobby as I see but also uh, somebody something linked with our own connectivity here so because all this is coming via zoom maybe we, we give it we withdraw on the top of it, I'm a myopa, huh? so <laughs> I'm trying to grasp if the name is in the screen. He's not with us anymore, Vlado, can you help me? Ah, okay, he will try to find another place and he will get back. Okay, so let's go, let's go on with the conversation. Yeah, technology is good, but um, it's limited also. So let's, uh, let's, let's have another round. Let's try maybe to be uh, a little bit um, um, faster with this uh, second round because then uh, I really want to engage a conversation with the audience. And for the second round, let's maybe keep the same order. Laura, you were mentioning uh, the power shift. And um, also, it has been said, uh, the word empowerment, I think, is really a key word. How do we achieve empowerment in our organizations, in our movements? And to what extent this is a strong element in order to sustain our... How, how do you do to sustain your community? Because, uh, you know, how do you relate to victories? I know because I'm, I, I am part of the community, to be honest. So, uh, so I do um, maybe rather offline, uh, online that offline. But how, how does it work, you know, to sustain the movement between one victory, uh, one failure? How, what, is, what is the DNA of this uh, community building, in, particularly in online activism, which is something new? relatively in Europe? Yeah, really good question. I'll try to be much briefer this time. I mean, I think the first thing is, you know, creating a sense of belonging. So giving people a chance not just to take action themselves, but also to meet other people, to see what other people are doing, whether that's via webinars, starting to organize meetings on the ground. We're trying to start organizing a group in Belgium that can you know, uh, help us with some of the bringing the color and the noise and the passion to the EU institutions on the streets outside. Um, so you know, creating that belonging, um, talking to people about the long term and the short term, right? So we have a long term vision of systemic change and this is what it looks like. Um, and being really clear that we make a difference between small wins in a framework of a bigger vision of change and incremental change. We want the first one, the small wins along the way, but not the incremental change, which is different. It, it, it's just, you know, always stopping bad stuff from happening, right? So the small wins could be, for example, taking down one corporation that is not paying its taxes on a wider vision of tax justice and corporations paying their taxes. Um, another thing is that I think people feel uh, power when they have a sense of how change can happen. So what we do is provide a sense of when do we need to push, who do we need to push, what might move those people, that's the bit that often gets forgotten, right? What, what motivates that person, what motivates uh, Timmermans to move, right? What does he care about? Um, also, uh, yeah, going, giving a sense to people that there are moments when we need to go wide and there are moments when we need to go deep. And what I mean by that is, there are moments when you, know, you need a sense of the mass and, you, and a petition with 300,000 people can really help. Literally, Timmermans' cabinet said to us recently, ah, you have 70,000 signatures on that uh, petition. Come back to us when you have 100,000. <laughs> really interesting. But there, are, there is also evidence that sometimes 30 people calling one member of the European Parliament that has a load of power in a particular issue, calling them saying, I'm your constituent, I'm going to vote for you in 2024 or perhaps not, and I'm really worried that Europe is about to massively contribute to the deforestation 
uh, of Brazil, of the Congo, etc., via food, soy, etc., that is coming uh, to our markets. Um, so uh, those parts, and yeah, I guess that when people see the wins, and recently, this is the last thing I'll say, you know, the wins are not just at the EU institutional level, but also the Europe of the common cause and struggle. So for example, a land grab by Rio Tinto in Serbia, where local communities see that we can broadcast what they're doing at a broader European level and get attention for it, get the media coverage, support everything they're doing, and they have just you know, won a part of that campaign, or a megaport being dropped on Tenerife um, that will destroy an entire marine reserve with very doubtful local development potential for Tenerife, where again the local communities say, ah, the European Union is part funding that port. Could you get us some, some connection there? So all these things, basically. Yeah. Thank you much. And uh, my remark regarding time was not addressed to you because you are one of the most disciplined. So thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, and yeah, thank you also for, for pointing the, the very uh, crucial importance of linking these levels, you know, and how important it is also for the community action not to stay only in the community and to build bridges between the local and the transnational and the translocal, because this is really key also to have this feeling of empowerment, which is very easy probably to create in a, in a community and in a movement that has created identity over the time. But then it's complicated also to, to transfer it transnationally. And we all, we all know those that have uh, pan-European networks, how difficult it is also, you know, not only to bring a struggle from the local to the Europeans, but that, let's say, that we learn how to do it. And we, we are, I think we are doing it quite well. And we get more and more attention from the European institutions. Let's not only be negative about our impact, even though, even though we don't see immediate change like we would like to see in the, in the policies, but at least I think that we managed to, to get their attention and to make them at least understand that something is wrong in the way that they approach things. But uh, thank you very much for pointing, and I hope that also in the discussion we will be able to come back to these links that are essential between different levels. Annika, um, so you are you are um, in a kind of transnational uh, activism mode. Um, can you tell us maybe from your experience um, how do you feel uh, about the Europe's colonial uh, legacy? Do you feel that this is an important element in the way that uh, international activism is being built today? Uh, also. How, how it impacts politics when it comes to uh, international politics and also ultimately what do you feel that is the impact in our own agency, in our own way of making change and building us as change makers? Do you feel that there is an issue that is really at the agenda of the movements? Uh, how, how do you relate to this issue in your activism? Okay. Well, um, I, I think I'll focus on three main issues um, from that intervention or that scope of questioning. Um, you know, first is the role of uh, community-driven organizations or communi these community organizations in um, civil society and uh, direct implementation or support towards community members. And secondly is, you know, um, the evolution of political parties and the synergy between political parties and, um, you know, politicians and civil society. So I would say that a lot of times in many spaces, you know, um, um, my country included or my context included, and I'll just put it out there that I haven't lived in Europe, so I don't have any context. My context comes from an African perspective, just so that you have that in mind as well. But you know, having read extensively, traveled extensively, I, I see a common pattern across the world is that you know, the systems of political parties have maintained themselves in structures of patriarchy and uh, you know, uh, chauvinistic spaces, but we keep on asking this system to produce young people and, and women as leaders. But have we looked at the, the leadership of political parties? Have we seen the representation of young people in the leadership of political parties? I know there are some countries in Europe that have been able to produce young leaders, you know, like the Prime Minister of, I think, Finland, if I'm not wrong, and others. But who holds them to account? Who owns the party that, um, you know, 
promotes them to that level of power, then that means that as much as we have the representation of women and young people and other groups that like the LGBT community, they still do not have power if they are still you know, held ransom by the powers that be at the political uh, party system. And there's always a demarcation, like civil society, I would say, most times feel stuck up uh, because they are technocrats and they are there to bring on change, they are not politicians. But in my country, I come from Kenya, we had a, an epiphany sort of, and we said, you know, we are tired of politicians running government, and we are tired of them um, doing things that, you know, look ridiculous. And so we said, why is it, what is the rule? Who said that uh, technocrats, professors, cannot be in government? If you have all these ideas in your school or in your, you know, civil society, why can't you come and, and implement what you have created? Why do you just have to be consulted and left out? And so in the Kenyan constitution, we said, if before when you were a member of parliament, then you are elected to be a minister and so you implement. But we demarcated that and said, we do not want members of parliaments being ministers. And so ministers now are appointed from the techno, uh, the professional society, the technocrats, and then you know they have to go through a vetting process that is live on, you know, on television and everybody sees the person handling this docket, are they valuable or are they you know, uh, experienced? And so civil society, I think in my view, should be very present in the spaces of government and leadership. They should not just you know, be on the outside or just telling Brussels what they need to do because when you look at the colonial you know, history and now the clamor for Africa as an investment hub, of course it is neocolonialism, um, but then you know, we still have uh, Europe coming to Africa saying that we are better because China you know, is taking all your government and all your public resources. We don't do that. But still, you see, it's sort of um, the race for you know, child marriage because, of, of course, the continent has already gone through issues. So as civil society, how do we say you need to come to the table with clean hands? You know, we cannot you know, propagate this system of accountability while we still have you know, France holding central banks of other countries and, you know, so su such internal mechanisms of evaluation and saying, you know, how does civil society hold political powers to account and not separate themselves to a space of only activism. And lastly, sorry for the time, but I'd say in the role of community-driven organizations, um, Africa and other Asian spaces are receivers of aid. So how... Um, Laura fundraises is very different from how we fundraise because we rely on international, I, what we call INGOs. And as you all know, the Grand Bargain was, you know, established here in Europe, basically for humanitarian spaces, but we're now pushing for them, you know, through the Charter for Change and others to be also part of the development space. And so the issue now is who holds them to account? They have come together and said, we will devolve 25% of, you know, all resourcing towards the community. And they do not have a, me a methodology or you cannot say you will devolve and the people you're devolving to are not part of the conversation to say, okay, yes, they devolve this money. And so we are having instances of review after every, I don't know, five years to say, okay, so what's the progress? But during COVID, 0.01% of money got to the communities. And I think even in Europe, in the communities is where, you know, politicians are getting votes. And today we no longer are tied to be political politically correct. So as we look down on politicians, we should also remember that they are representing what our society looks like today. People are saying they don't want immigrants. They don't want, you know, um, you know, race is being talked about more. LGBTQ is now, you know, there are people who just say they don't agree with it and we can't do anything about their views nowadays because, you know, the, the system has changed in the, era, in the era of Trump. So I would, I would uh, summarize by saying that, you know, um, civil society, should not be a standalone or a different conversation. And we should move towards integrating these two spaces in both politics and you know, governance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amazing. It seems to be quite a consensus in our conversation. And I remember when we first asked ourselves this, uh, this question, um, we already uh, were a kind of taboo breakers. <laughs> uh, uh, I remember we were in Belgrade in 2017. Uh, where the big question on the table was to be or not to be political. And there were already uh, in the movement a lot of organizations that o not only historically they were having links with the political spaces, but mostly in the Eastern European part, the way that civil society has been built after the fall of the Iron Curtain was very much on an apolitical, um, often 
donors-driven way of development of civil society, not so much gr rooted in the communities, and uh, somehow top down to the communities to teach them democracy and fundamental rights, which was very much needed, but then also uh, created this feeling that uh, in order to survive, you need to be apolitical, not to mess with the dirty, uh, because we had our history. So thank you for bringing this. This seems to be a consensus. Also, Calypso invited us to <laughs> to hijack the power and to, to get out of, the, out of the us and them. Um, I don't know to what extent uh, it is a subordination relation. In any case, they seem to be more powerful. So how can we overcome, um, at least in the short term, how can we overcome these us and them relation? And how do you think yeah, that we should relate maybe in a different manner to, to power itself? Um, let's also try to think about the European institutions because you are creating this space in the EUI where you try to you know, bridge uh, between academics, also between practitioners, and then also during the conference on the future of Europe, you try to build bridges also with the institutions. So how, how do you see these issues? What, what would be here some building blocks that we can use for the future in our relations with the institutions to, to try to overcome this, uh, also us and them dissatisfaction uh, type of relationship? Very quickly. Uh it's always a challenge to, to walk that line that you also all walk between cooperation and co-optation. So I think that's the, always being aware of that and the fact that you don't want to lose your soul. So any, everything that Anika was talking about and Laura, you know, just remembering the history of social movement is a palimpsest, a layers of struggles where many people died, many people gave up their lives, volunteered forever. Um, and, and, and so this is our soul. And remembering these struggles in history um, while we're sitting in some lovely place in Berlaymont drinking coffee with cookies. Um, so to me, that's the first uh, demand. And when, you, when we have the conversation with Anika, at EUI, you know, and we ask what is to be done, and you, every one of your countries has learned, militants have learned everywhere from these histories, whether in con consciously or unconsciously, and respecting all that diversity and bottom up, and that no academic or expert or anyone, a politician or UN general secretary can tell what you should do in your local struggles. Now that being said then, okay, then we compose with power and we, and, and those who have the leverage of capital and money and, um, and, and that's what life is uh, in politics. And Annika herself is telling us, look, we work with political parties. And um, so then the question is um, that we've confronted several times is several kind of layers of question. One is whether you kind of work with a system of representative democracy that has alienated so many people uh, or do you just re reject it and say, no, all we need is democratic innovation, deliberation, direct democracy? So that's one answer. And I, I, for one, think that we can't change if we don't accept that there is a representative system, that you can change political parties from within, that you can try to change what parliaments do, European parliaments, etc. But you always need to do it with a kind of cynical doubt that to remember that whatever lip service politici these, that realm pays to social movements, to civil society organizations to which they still haven't given a, a statute at the European level, etc., they kind of feel threatened and, and that one doesn't want to take them at their word. And I know that's cynical, but that's what I felt again and again, and, and we've seen that. So how you compose with representative democracy and then how you combine um, Alexandra, uh, different types of democratic innovation. So uh, Donatella comes back to Chile. We, we were all so inspired by the Chilean experience. We didn't see the 62% coming. At least I didn't. Okay, I, shouldn't, I should just speak for myself, but I didn't. I mean, maybe I don't know Chile well enough. Certainly I don't. But my Chilean friends didn't either. Because they were so, it was so amazing and wonderful, this democratic constitutional movement where all social movements were integrated, but they kind of forgot to say how, to what extent do we mirror a society that's still pretty traditional, some of what you were saying, Annika. Um, and probably one of the ways to deal with this would have been and might be in the future 
to use much more democracy by lottery, randomly selected, which they didn't. So let's um, internalize the, the power of that new wave, of the deliberative wave, and use it, but in combination with direct democracy, in combination with the creativity of social movements who were marginalized at the Conference on the Future of, of Europe, I think, but you were so active, Alexandrina, you can say much more to that, many in the room can. So these are some of the answers, but I would just add one point because Christophe is now gonna say something, and what he says is so important and deep, which is that you know, at the end of the day, if you don't offer that vision, what is the vision? How does it combine you know, the bonds of day-to-day -day local, and that is the, usually was with the right traditionally, with the bonds with the stranger that was with the left, okay? So we are, it's not about being right in the middle ideologically, but it's, a, it's that translocal left that we keep on talking about. That is the vision I think we need to, to offer and to, to develop, um, and so that at the end of the day, we. The really hard trade-offs of climate change, end of the month, end of the year, and all of that, need to be owned by us. Need to be owned by us in all these decisions. Citizens need to decide how, what it actually means. Um, and I think that's the progressive vision, and it translates in very concrete things on the ground. So if you can, uh, we know that you have a plan or even though you said that it's a tough question to answer, but yes, try to, try to bring us to, to these answers because you, you very rightfully pointed that we, we are living in a paradox that we see that these forces that we want to combat in our societies, they are almost marginal, but still the paradox is that, look, in, in Italy they managed to, to get to power and in so many countries, and we are seeing almost there in France, and it is, it is a tragedy. Uh, so how, how, how can we, you already said that, uh, in, in very beautiful terms that uh, it's not only the responsibility and it's primarily the responsibility of, let's say, scattering political forces on the left and not so much of our action, but still, how can we connect to these dots? How do you think that is possible? Do you see a role for social movements and civil society to try to contribute to re reinvigorate political forces, to build this political representation and how? How would you see some building blocks? Yeah. At this level, I am not so optimistic. I think that will require time. <laughs> it will not be done soon. But uh, at the moment, uh, I have two preoccupations. The first one is to do little step to rebuild the global vision, how to have an articulation between a, a struggle against patriarchy, a struggle uh, to change the relationship between humanity and nature, social issues, democratic issues. And we can do it by a link with academic, but also social movement, people who are on the ground, people from different cultures uh, and different vision of the world. Okay, that is a job we are, several of us, uh, starting to do step by step. But at the same time, we have to be on the ground and and at this level, I really think that it's maybe a little different with Laura, that uh, the idea that we need to organize, it's a good idea, but that will not work, to be honest. Me, because of my age, I am a guy of organization. For example, all my life, adult life, I was part of a union, all the time. I never stopped to be unionized, never. I was, most of my time, part of political parties. And I'm happy about it, and uh, I did it all, most of my time. I am part of ATTAC and other social movement and organization. But the young people around me, they are not part of that. When I spoke to my students, I asked them, do you go to demonstration? All of them were going to the streets, often. Are you part of a union, an association, a political party? One on 100. Uh, and that was a rea reality in the most of, of our, the scene in France for sure, but I think in most of the developed countries and probably beyond that. Uh. And the, the task is not to say that the civil society, the organized civil society has no role to play. Of course we have. Uh. But knowing that we will be very small organization in very big mass movement. And time to time it's comfortable Time to time is more difficult. To give you two examples, to go to Friday for the future big demo, I think all of us will be happy because young people uh, like uh, where we were when we were 18, uh, students, people of our world, and for a good cause. Nice, great, so on. But when we had the yellow vest in France, there was a big discussion among the unions and the left party to know if we are going there or not. 
most of us, we were there, and I think we were right to do it. Uh, Attack was there with the left uh, groups, not all of them, but part of them, so, some unions, but not a lot. Uh, a lot of unions refused, uh, only Solidaire was there. But I think we were right to be with the Yellow Vest, but knowing that most of the people who were on the street vote for the National Front, of course. Uh, we have to know that, and there are my neighbors in my uh, electorate, the, my deputy is National Front. All my neighbors vote for the National Front, but we are able to have struggled together how to do that with small organization. That, for me, is one of the main challenges. That exists in the history. In the middle of the 19th century in France, and probably in Italy, the Carbonari and others were very small. Huh? as organized people, but we had big revolution at the same time. And we are a little bit in this situation when we can have huge movements, and the mass movements are not the problem. We have mass movements in the street all the time. But the people organized in those demonstrations are generally very few, but they play an important role at the same time because they are the interface with the institution, with the political parties, but knowing that we will be always quite small. And that, I will not be more long because it's more opening question than answering to them, but it's one of my main challenges. Thank you so much. So I think we get back to the issue of fragmentation. <laughs> that uh, it's an eternal question. And uh, I think it's crucially important also to learn and to carry this legacy because if, um, if in 2003 it was possible to have the world biggest demonstration against the war in Iraq, it's of course because of the urgency of the situation, but it is, I think, mainly because of the tradition of the links that were built between progressive movements uh, and that sometimes we feel that they are broken in the period they are, that we are living, despite massive uh, moments that we see in the streets, but somehow we see missing links between these moments and then the actors that are in the organizations whose action is needed actually to build and sustain these, these narratives. But I think that in all these small and scattered spaces like ours today, we somehow contribute to do it. We just somehow don't, don't know how to reach scale. And... Um, so this will be a question that remains uh, to, be, to be discussed also in the, in the small group sessions, but we still have 20 minutes up for a debate, and thank you so much for being patient and, uh, and listening, I hope, to very, very interesting points already, but now, please take the floor. And uh, don't limit yourself to uh, just ask questions. Please uh, also bring contributions, comments, whatever you want to share, experience. Who would like to jump? Thank you so much for this very inspiring conversation. Um, it's clear to me that we have today big challenges with uh, climate justice, with inequalities, um, with democratic backsliding uh, that is going on with the increase of far right. So. Um, Apart from the sectorial uh, struggles, feminist, anti-racist, climate justice struggles, it seems to me that we need to, broad, to, to bring um, and make broader alliances and coalitions. So my question would be, from your experience, what is it that uh, can actually promote these broader alliances and what, what can hinder these kind of alliances? Thank you. I, su I suggest we take some more questions and then we do a round of other questions, comments. Certainly, uh, Donatella and uh, the other personalities who are on the floor are right when they speak about small victories. It's very small victories. Uh, the proof we are we are six women, only one man. Oh, okay, there is changement. I see. Thanks, uh, Christophe. To <laughs> but, uh, You're an adopted woman. <laughs> oh, sorry. But my, my question is, uh, how will react the actors of civil society when you speak with us and we said we are in full uh, victories? How will they react? I am very impatient to have the position of uh, uh, Colleagues from Hungary, Marta Lampard, who is here uh, about the uh, situation in Poland, OFOP. Uh, I would like to, to know how they react when the, you, you speak about victories. 
somebody else? Yes, and thank you so much for the interesting points so far. It's really been really nice uh, listening to the different arguments and many different important topics. And talking about the Gen Z, um, <laughs> we're quite a few, a little group here from a project called um, doing some act campaigns where we try to connect different countries in Europe. Um, and I'm from Denmark and uh, uh, the young people in Denmark are trying to do a lot, especially on climate issues. But meanwhile, they're facing a well-being crisis. We have the highest numbers ever of anxiety, stress, and so on. So what I've been listening to when political uh, politicians are addressing these concerns is about like, well, the young people, they are doing a lot on climate, and that, that's so inspiring. But what I feel there's a still a lack of is the intergenerational way of approaching those issues because we cannot leave it all to one generation to fix the future problems and we're not seeing enough on those issues talking about we need a lot of activism we need to change the systems but what about the, the well-being what about uh, um, self-care and activism what about dealing with uh, a job studying higher prices inflation and still struggling with having the whole world on your shoulders. So um, um, I think like, what can we do to involve young people, not as only them taking agency of their future, but also inviting them into um, decision makers, uh, people with in position of power. Thank you so much. Is there any question right now? Yes, let's take another question. We go back to the panel and then back to the room, not to lose track of uh, all the interesting questions. Thank you very much. Um, if I understood it well, you were talking about also the, the power of organized, of, of organized movements, so of organization, that is on the strength of a movement. And, but, but now we are living a lot uh, on the fact that a lot of social movements, a lot of participation is more based on an individual basis, no? Like you were saying, people is going to a demonstration, but maybe it's not getting organized. My question is, um, okay, this is something that it's uh, interesting or it's um, good, let's say, for the right, for the system, for capitalism, but don't you think that somehow academia sometimes and also the left defending so much the social movements versus the traditional left organized organization is also somehow weakening ourselves no because it's it's like a dilemma that i always have like um if we if we say that being organized is so much important but we also defend like uh, these uh, the social movements that are more like flowing but not really organized isn't somehow a weak a way of weakening ourselves thank you for the questions to answer i will try to get back i see that john Mejai is back with us i'm really sorry i i think that technology shows its limitation and my own limitation is my own myopia so i'm really sorry I think I probably I missed the moment when you reconnected and then I didn't give you the floor in the end. So please, please accept my apologies for this and I will try to make it up and give you the floor right now to also say maybe what you wanted to say before and also we want to hear some insights from the COP, what, what do you feel that the stakes are and also the civil society, what, what can we expect from these kind of processes. And if you want also to pick up some of the questions that have been asked to give an answer to so all these in, uh, let's say, five minutes because I'm really sorry I deprived you of, uh, of your speaking time. Let's hope it works. Yeah, uh, am I audible now? Please go on, <laughs> go on to see. Can you hear me? We hear you, but we don't understand if we will hear you well. So please try to, to, to speak and I will... Yeah, go on, go on. And in case yeah. it doesn't work, I will... Interview. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is uh, this is what happens when the youth uh, have cops in country where there are no 
networks and also we feel this has been done uh, deliberately because there has been no uh, proper Wi-Fi access inside the blue zone as well. So this is the limitation that we are facing here. Uh, at COP, uh, I'll just quickly touch around the first round uh, of how civil societies can work and I'll try to also break a global perspective and transnational perspective of what we have done and what uh, we feel that uh, we should be doing. So what we have seen in the Europe is still the civil society movement or the youth movement is very strong. But uh, if we compare it from the uh, civil societies of Asia Pacific region or the Americas or the Africa, there is there is some lack. And what we need to uh, do to strengthen the civil society movement is, uh, is the knowledge sharing and the capacity building. So I also heard someone ask the question of uh, but how the youth can be there without uh, there, like it's the jobs and inflation is rising so the capacity building has to be there so civil society movements also societies in particular have to make sure that there is proper capacity building so that the youth that are involved in the climate movement or uh, political movements they have they have this opportunity to also get uh, something out of it and uh, we have seen youth in europe basically the youth movement there are really strong ways uh, we have seen big marches climate strikes going on but that's not particularly the case uh, also in other parts of the world because of uh, the uh, political system, the democracies, and how much the restrictive some governments are uh, when it's come to societies and their involvement. I also very much agree with what Anika said that we don't only want to have civil societies uh, like work separately, but civil societies also have to interfere with the political systems. And it's very necessary to be at policy making levels and we have to make sure that uh, there are youth and the civil society as policy making levels and at uh, government levels. And apart from that, what we need is that uh, there should be like more uh, local networks uh, connected to transnational networks and a correlation between transnational networks. Because uh, this is really necessary to have a global movement and uh, like a better connection that we should be having to fight against uh, the things that we plan uh, at local level. So, that's what we like. We have to think locally, act locally, but also uh, act globally as well. So the coordination between transnational movements and civil society net networks organization has to be there. So yeah, and coming to COP, uh, uh, I'm here in Sharm El Sheikh at COP 27. Uh, the setup this time is uh, very different. There has been a lot of security briefings on what to say, what not to say. So that's why. I was not able to uh, speak very freely before uh, because there are people and uh, there has been many cases where the hotels have just uh, stopped the journalists, the local media, the, some journalists to not to be present at COP with the authorities. So it has been really uh, frustrating. This COP uh, made inside uh, having Wi Fi issues inside the COP or whatever. So, yeah, these are the logistics, logistical issues and also the uh, deprivement of uh, free speech and uh, free press. Uh, so, yeah, apart from that, there are more than 600 fossil fuel lobbyists uh, in this COP, which is an increment of 25% from COP26 Glasgow. So, that is really sad. Uh, apart from that, there is uh, uh, negotiations, which is like loss and damage financing is the hot, top, hot topic this year. Uh, which is going so uh, loss and damage financing has been involved in the agenda which is a good start but uh, sadly there has there has been no mention of liability and compensation so uh, it's again the discussions are going on with uh, giving credits and giving the loans soft loans etc so what we are trying here is where we are trying to uh, pressurize the global north to have uh, to take them as responsibility and we are meeting the uh, uh, like we met the uh, Minister of uh, International Development of Norway and Minister of Environment. We are going to the lead negotiators of Global North, also going to the lead negotiators of Global South to get a perspective on, on what's the stand of uh, the Global North countries uh, on loss and damage because what we are hearing outside, like not because we are not allowed to speak in negotiation rooms. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry. These are off. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm yeah. really sorry, but. Uh, Looking in the room, I really have the feeling that we grasp not even the half of what you say. So unfortunately, 
I really, really apologize. I mean, we grasp a few words, but it's such a pity to to not be able to enjoy this conversation. So I really apologize for the for the conditions in which we we connected with you, and I really hope that in the future we will have a real connection because we really want to to stay engaged with you. So. Thank you so much for your contribution, but I'm really sorry. It's, it's just simply not working, sorry. And let's now get back to the panel. I also realized that we really need to rush a little bit to the end. Uh, let's try to answer very quickly to, you don't need to answer all the questions. Pick just the question that is most dear to your heart to answer to. And then please also, uh, in doing so, also have uh, closing remarks. And Donatella, in this round, I want also to include you. And then uh, we will all enjoy a coffee break. Let's go, yeah, from Christoph to. Let me to start, yeah. Very, very short, uh, point by point. The, the, how to struggle against fragmentation. I will only use one uh, reflection. It was Judith Butler when she was invited, uh, the, the feminist uh, specialist in gender study. She was invited in uh, Occupy Wall Street. And Occupy Wall Street was a strange mix of homeless and young students with leftist group. And she had to discuss with them and to de give a speech. And what she said, the only thing she said, and I think it was very inspiring, is that you have to accept the weakness of the other, the vulnerability of the others, meaning your own vulnerability. When you say that, that it's a good lesson to stop silo politics or sectarism, where only your struggle is important and you have to understand the other, very briefly. To the second issue, which is uh, uh, the risk to marginalize the organized people and to really don't take account of the importance of your unions and political parties. I totally agree with you. But if people are not organized, it's for more deep issues. The first one is the level of education. When people go to the uni and so on, they don't need to have a sort of intermediary and the people who are above them. The second issue is because when I was young and start to be organized, the organization gave me the information the formation and the capacity to act, to go to the street. Today you do all those things by digital, by Facebook, Twitter, or whatever you want. And that makes uh, less important the fact to be organized. But of course we have to defend the organized. And I finish by your question about what to tell to the people who say that you are victory. The problem is that all victories are very soon seen as granted. For example, to the idea that a child has to be to school more than in a mine <laughs> or in a field, uh, it's obvious for us, but it was not the case in the 19th century, and all victories are seen as granted. For example, the fact that the gay have the same right than the others is granted, but in fact it's a result of a lot of struggle, and it's a way to explain that uh, we have in our society the result of centuries of struggle. Thanks. No more than one question to, an to answer, <laughs> if you can, if you can. Always, uh, there's always been what we call in French les minorités agissantes in history, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, people are different vis-a-vis -vis politics. So for me, it, just to give it in slogan, Alexander Knight, uh, yeah, I've always believed we need to walk with two legs. Yeah, clicked activism and um, protest and everything on that side, and power. You know, I've always worked with the Socialist International family in, in, ever since I was, you know, 15. And we each have our choices in how we walk with two legs. Now, today, for me, it's eco-socialism that we need to promote. But also, small victories vis-a-vis um, -vis institutions. How do we sustain the victories? And I'm very inspired by our friends from Poland because here we need to always ask institutions to do no harm. You give money to Poland, you don't empower, disempower social movement. But it's not an ad hoc thing. It's to think always long term. We need the institutions to be watched all the time, not just by the Poles, but by everyone in Europe who give their taxpayers money to, um, to uh, which wrongly empower governments there. And finally, on you know Generation Z and generations working together. Of course, we all believe this here. Um, but there are very concrete institutional ways to do it, which we're not doing in the governments, we're not doing in cities, we're not doing in Brussels, which is very systematic long-term impact assessment, very systematic assemblies of young people watching on every rules and regulation and directives that come out. And finally, I want to say about it's so important as we're here and trying to listen to Jeanne Medjan, and I think that's a beautiful metaphor 
for what I would think about as the, transna the local tragedy of transnational theaters. There are so many of our friends there in Egypt, Asham el Sheikh, but the young Egyptians are not allowed to walk there. They're in jail, etc., cetera, and they are, that is being ignored, except we know about it, but it is being ignored by the powers that be. So the silos of global social politics you know, is something we need to break, and this, is, this was a great metaphor for it, because by the way, I, we know that many of them are listened to when they try to communicate with us today or elsewhere. Okay, I'm going to respond to the young gentleman who spoke about welfare and um, you know, well-being of young people, and that is something that is very passionate to me or uh, very close to my heart because I spent a lot of my young um, you know, adult life um, uh, knowing in my heart that I didn't want to work, work for private sector or for government, I wanted to work in civil society, but I had to go through a long journey of, you know, not having any resources. And I think this is something we need to speak about in the civil society space. There's a lot of shame in asking for resources for yourself and for your well-being. And even if we say that, you know, you need to get therapy, how much is therapy per session? You know, it's, it's almost unaffordable for a lot of people. And, and so I say, even as you organize, sometimes with the, you know, Fridays for Future for climate change, it's the, it's the best thing to do as a young person right now to be in the climate change. But then, you know, are we being managed as young people to drive a civil society narrative while nothing is changing? The capitalist society that holds or hosts um, this, you know, companies providing these emissions, a lot of the emissions that we have today are, you know, from the industrial revolution space, you know, some of the uh, times when America was really coming up. And the Western world has created the narrative today, the numbers are showing, that, you know, it is China that is, you know, um, you know number one in, um, in destroying the space. But then we are not holding anyone to account for things that happened before, the things that got us to this place, that, you know, um, China did not contribute as much as they're contributing to now, but we are focusing on the now, and then we're using young people in this you know, um, fight or uh, framing the narrative, and the young people we're using as well, they are spending their time on the streets, you know, in, in countries like, uh, you know, like mine, if you're on the street, you're definitely either going to hospital the next day because you'll be tear gassed. It's not all fun, you know, as the way it is, it is done in, in um, I think I was in Brussels, uh, in, the, in October, and there was a climate activist, and they had police protection, it was all nice and merry. Our protests are not like that, because most of the time, it's like, you know, what is happening in Iran. It's a fight, you know, for life, for, for governance, for, you know, a, a lot of things. So I would say that it is important as civil society, we recognize that resourcing, and that's why I talked about resourcing of community organizations, resourcing of young people in civil society movements is really important. Resourcing of young feminists, resourcing of community organizations, because this people risk their lives. When you're saving a girl from GBV or from early marriage, you're literally putting your life on the line and then you don't even have anywhere to take her. And sometimes when you're asking for, you know, salary increase or anything like that, you say, you have to justify, oh, I have an autistic baby or my, my who has cancer. You know, it doesn't have to be like that. And, you know, when, when, Af when, um, when people from Europe come into Africa, they live in the best places, they have the best, you know, resources, they live like, you know, the diplomat life is very uh, uh, wonderful, but if, if we are k taking money to the grassroots, uh, we are saying, no, 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 we only want this money to put girls in school. We don't want to pay anyone who does the vetting and, you know, gets the girls and provides their psychological care. So we are also being, um, I don't know, hypocritical in this space, because what we are fighting for outside, we are not practicing in this space. We still do not have equal pay in, in civil society. Society. We do not know what every, you know people earn, and that is why feminist foreign policy needs to really come into the aid conversation, so that we can look at are we providing feminist principles that are good enough for young people to prosper and be in the movement and also create a career, you know, in the space. Thank you. Yes, I address one uh, question, and it is the question about uh, uh, small organizations and uh, massive movements that Christophe had mentioned, but was also mentioned in terms of uh, uh, how academics could either uh, strengthen or weaken uh, the uh, social movements. I have to say, I don't think academics are so influential, 
But uh, I think that what we need to do is uh, to try to understand which are the conditions and which are the consequences uh, of some types of organizing. I remember once I was on a podium with an uh, important Italian trade unionist who said, in my time, in his time, uh, uh, the proof of the strength of the union was that you could call for a strike for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, people could, would go to work again. These are no longer the same times, and it has been a long time that this is no longer true. Uh, in social movement studies, there is a difference made between collective actions in which organizations are relevant and connective actions in which there is a different constellation. So individuals are able to promote uh, activism, and this has been important also for uh, recent waves of protest, like the Black Lives Matter, uh, for instance, that was promoted often uh, by very tiny group of people, it was important for the water referendum because it was a small uh, group of individuals that uh, in some cases had not participated in politics before that uh, uh, took the uh, agency really and participated. Uh, so I, I think uh, some types of organizational format uh, are more uh, appropriate for sometimes some types of movements, uh, uh, some constituencies, uh, and so on. Of course, it also has uh, challenges that are not only there when you have a complex movement as the Gilets Jaunes, uh, but are also there, for instance, uh, in uh, Fridays for Future, where also there is uh, very small groups of organizers uh, capable of mobilizing masses. And uh, um, I think some realities are not in our hands to change. So trend toward individualism, use of uh, social media and so on, uh, uh, are there to stay. Uh, what uh, activists can do is also to see how different modes could be con uh, connected or could be linked. And so how, as in the case of uh, the Black Lives Matters, connective forms of actions that empower uh, uh, progressive individuals could be connected with networks of uh, organizations that are still active. But we don't have to forget also uh, uh, some positive outcomes of uh, these forms of connective actions of empowering the individuals because moments uh, uh, like uh, the camps uh, during the uh, anti-austerity protest, uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, protest, in the pandemic, several type of uh, very rank and file forms of organizations are also important in doing something that the European Social Forum did 20 years ago that is involving also people that didn't have uh, um, forms of uh, uh, political experiences before and involving people that very often told us when we did surveys that they didn't come with an organization. They had an Archie membership cards in their pocket, but it was already the case that in order to get uh, uh, new generations, new people involved, uh, you also had to uh, look at the trade-off uh, between uh, uh, organized uh, participations and individual participations which enriched the movements already then. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we will not have time, and I, I already negotiated my, and I will uh, try to make up in another, in in some ways. But the th issue that we have is that it, in these historical buildings we cannot have coffee, so the coffee break is outside, and also the place that privatized for us uh, this space will open to the public. So we need to go now to the coffee break. I th I think we don't even have time to. Or do we have time to tell to people how the small breakup groups will work or will we'll do it in the uh, beginning? Yeah, so let's go, follow the group. Outside, in front, there is the coffee space where we will all have coffee and then we need to go all back here in the room and you will receive explanations of where the small group discussions will